Graphics Project 2021. Um, I'm Yunjae Choi. Some of you might know me from taking my class in the past or maybe even the semester. Um, I teach a class in, in the visual um, study sequence called Design of Typography. Um, and some of you might even be familiar with graphics project from previous years. There's actually a pretty robust um, archive um, online on the GSAP website, which I encourage you to refer to. Um, the graphics project is an annual series of lectures, discussions, and portfolio reviews exploring the role of graphic design within the field of architecture. The goal is to examine various methods of visual communication used to convey concepts to both specialists and general audiences. These events aim to help students build a successful graduation portfolio, but also hopefully trigger a lasting interest in how representation relates to the work itself. And all of this while unpacking the topics, tools, and trends of contemporary graphic design. Um, this weekend, there will be four presentations. Tonight, we have Jonathan Jackson and Gian Rim speaking. Um, and tomorrow, two of our very own alum and recent portfolio winners, Andrew Kong and Michael McDowell will be speaking, um, as well as Josh Jordan from The Making Studio. So let me introduce you to our first speaker that will kick off this series of events for 2021. Um, Jonathan Jackson is a principal of We Should Do It All with a degree in architecture from Kent State University. He has over 17 years of architectural, spatial and graphic design experience working with a range of global brands. Jonathan's multifaceted portfolio includes environmental, graf and environmental graphics and signage system for the Nike headquarters in New York, an exhibition design for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, which as many of you may know, um, is the David Ajay Design Museum that opened in Washington DC in 2016. Prior to uh, founding We Should Do It All in 2004, he worked for Studio Archea in Italy, Architectonics and Lindy Roy in New York. Jonathan has given lectures and attended reviews at the ESVMD in Switzerland, Uspine Night Design Festival in Antwerp, Belgium, Harvard GSD, University of Michigan, Syracuse Architecture, RISD, and GSAP. Um, I've personally been an admirer of Jonathan and his partner Sarah's and their studio's work for many years now. Um, we should do it all as a practice that truly integrates graphic work with spatial work, you know, the flat and the deep in ways that never feel forced or gratuitous. Um, and, you know, honestly, my hat's off to anyone that can successfully run a studio in this remarkable, but also admittedly very difficult and competitive city that is New York, um, whilst, you know, doing that, the kind of work that you can you can stand behind but also have fun while doing it um, and not to mention uh, raising a, a young family which you know or doing all of those things uh, at once is a quite a remarkable achievement um, and because I can safely assume that you're already already juggling a lot I'm so happy and grateful that you, you could join us today and you know on a Saturday evening no less thank you so much for coming thank you On mute. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the amazing introduction. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining us on a Saturday night. Um, maybe that speaks to the time and day that we're in uh, of COVID. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what else to say, but I'm honored to, to, to speak with you all about our work here tonight. I'm going to go ahead and get started and share our screen. Um, Thank you again, UJ. Uh, sorry. Can everyone see this? Thumbs up? Yes. Cool. All right. So um, let me just make some flat, deep, and in, in, in between. Um, we should do it all. Um, first, I have to say, uh, I do this before every presentation um, that show, to show off the team. Um, I'm here tonight as a representative of the studio. Uh, by no means is the work only mine. Um, there are multiple authors and voices to the work, um, even beyond this page uh, for those that are no longer uh, working at the studio. But um, Sarah, uh, the woman uh, next to the magenta dot that is me, uh, is my wife and partner. And um, yeah, we just feel like it's uh, really important for studios to be moving forward um, 
sort of uh, either lessening or de demystifying this idea of the individual being being the end all be all. Uh, I think it's very important for us to um, show off who we work for, who we work with, um, and be proud of that. So, um, as I mentioned, Sarah, um, partner. Um, next to her is Adrian, he's from France, uh, graphic designer. Below left is Christopher, he's from Texas. Uh, Janet, uh, next, next to him, she's from China. Mai Feng from Vietnam, and Courtney from New Jersey. Uh, and my wife Sarah is from New Jersey as well, and I'm New York born and bred, so. Um, but that's everybody, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a mix of 2D and, and 3D um, designers, and um, yeah, that's, that's it. So I'm gonna talk about some, some influences. Uh, one is this quote from the book, Time Enough for Love, written in 1972 by sci-fi writer Robert Heinlein. Uh, human beings should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly, specialization is for insects. Uh, I read this my senior year in architecture school and used it for we didn't have a thesis in a five-year program, but something like a, a thesis project um, and have stuck with it ever since. And it was sort of the, the impetus for our name, We Should Do It All, which is really goal-driven. We don't do it all. Uh, we hope to delve more into product design, uh, furniture design, uh, but we see this quote in our name as like always really opening ourselves to new challenges and, and wanting to take on, um, yeah, new facets of design, at least new to us. Uh, to keep to keep the thing keep things interesting in in the studio. Um, another influence uh, you all know who this person is. Um, we get exposed to so many things as architecture students. So many ways of working. The skill set is so broad and so incredibly valuable. Yet when all of you graduate, you kill each other to do the exact same thing: make buildings. I don't understand that. That's uh, Rem Kuhlhaus. Um, for me, this uh, came later as we had our practice, but it it reassured me that I, I, I went the proper right route and not doing traditional architecture and, um, you know, really looking at studios like two by four base, um, some other studios that we admire that that really mix it up. And um, yeah, this quote just kind of reassured me in that decision uh, to sort of step away from architecture in, in a way. Some beliefs. Um, I might get yelled at for some of these things, but uh, we believe design is design is design is, and to keep it open as much as possible. And while yes, there are very specific expertise one must learn um, within our different fields, whether it be architecture or furniture or graphics. Yes, of course, but we do believe that inherently there is a, a sameness to to producing some work, producing the work. Um, and I think for us, that allows us to keep an open mind when we try to take on new work, new types of projects. Um, I, I don't know if I can speak to everybody in the studio about this, but I believe that the dating relationship with the graphic designer and the architect can be labeled as still getting to know each other. They haven't kissed yet, they don't, they're only holding hands. And I, I say that in the sense of, uh, yes, uh, architects are doing graphic design on a daily basis. But as a field and as a profession, uh, the schools of architecture and the schools of graphic design are, 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 are very similar in their processes, but they never talk to each other. There's not, a not enough of a dialogue, at least from what I've seen and being able to lecture at many different schools. Um, and I think a prime example that we have that we all would hope to move forward with is the OMA two by four uh, relationship where, where there's a, a constant dialogue between the skin of the architecture uh, and which two by four touches uh, for LMA. But I can't, I struggle to constantly find um, those type of re relationships, successful relationships uh, throughout these two fields. And I think it's upon us to develop more of these to, to um, figure out who the next dynamic combo would be. Uh, I, I feel like that hasn't stepped up. Um, and it's just something I'm looking forward to seeing more of. I think we need more of that. 
but I think it also needs to start earlier. And, and could there be a change in our educational structure? And I love what Don Jay is doing with this particular program. Um, is it starting a dialogue between these two different fields um, to, to hopefully, again, demystify the idea that we can be so different. Um, the di I th you know, this goes with, with the previous, of what I just said, dialogue with the architect is essential, uh, especially in our work. Uh, you'll see in the projects that we're presenting tonight, only one of them, sorry, two of them uh, had nothing to do with an architecture institution or an architect. Um, it's a it's vital part of the work when, we, when it comes to signage or environmental graphics for us. Um, I think the architect pushes us and hopefully we push push their, their, their ways of thinking about, about space and what um, essentially like graphic design or environmental graphics can do enhance the space. Um, to the title of the, of the, of the talk, our, our flat seeks to dive deeper. It's constantly striving to be more than it is. Our deep uh, seeks simplicity. It's self-conscious about overdoing it. Our in-between is confused, but okay with that. Um, and with that, uh, I'll start some of the work. Um, I have to move some of your faces. <laughs> um, but anyway, the UTSOA poster, a lecture series poster for the University of Texas School of Architecture. Uh, we got asked last year to do both the fall and spring lecture uh, poster for, for them. Um, and they had no real brief other than, um, yeah, can you do this for us? And we were really excited about the possibilities and um, really wanted to focus on a couple of different things and um, thinking about architecture and um, how when I was in school, there were certain tools and um, symbols that were used that no longer live in, in the school of architecture these days, I would imagine, or at least to a lesser degree. And those symbols and, and tools have changed to um, sometimes uh, what you see, see here on the screen. Um, so this idea of the ghost of architecture's past and the ghost of architecture's present uh, was one mode that we took. Another mode that we took is trying to unveil or get architects to talk about the ugly side of architecture, uh, whether it be from a commercial point of view, um, disaster point of view, buildings failing, um, what have you. Uh, and then what you see on the right side of the screen are some of architecture's past, uh, the ghost of architecture's past with the, so mi microgramma typeface. Um, uh, other things that we were looking at were um, uh, sort of drawing tools, um, templates, usually they come in like green, transparent uh, plastic or orange uh, to help assist in, um, you know, your manual drawing uh, of putting the elevation of floor plan together. Um, so these were some things that we looked at um, and we presented our first round to, to our client. And um, this is one of the options that we presented. Uh, and keep in mind that we had some pretty heavy names coming to the school, Ben Van Berkel, uh, Michael Murphy, David Ajay, Ajay was coming, um, um, William O'Brien Jr. So there were some great names coming to the school and we wanted to sort of counteract that with um, a really blunt image uh, that just shows um, architecture from, an, from its ugly side and, and really question the role of, of the architect and, and what is architecture doing in our current day. Um, maybe it being the University of Texas and um, you know, a really successful school in its own right, uh, they were a bit afraid of going this route and they were really worried about what the image says about their school. Uh, I think for us, we were really interested in the idea of questioning, again, what, what is the role of the architect in this current day? Um, and, you know, in a, in, a, in a time where architecture is constantly seen as this pristine, beautiful, if you go on Instagram, it's really easy to find the most seductive uh, renderings and in final imagery with less people or not lived in spaces. Uh, I think this was our attempt to show, to counteract that. Um, it wasn't really well received, but they did like the idea of using the microgram typeface. Um, the other option that we presented three options, uh, past, present, and future. I'm showing you um, 
past and present, but also uh, this, this, uh, this concept here. Um, this is the ghost of architecture's present. The idea of taking a subject matter or what, um, of how um, a student might need something from TurboSquid or another sort of uh, 3D modeling program service if they're not building something themselves and using stock imagery, uh, we are really interested in, in showing, again, the tools of, of making architecture. Um, and, and with this route, uh, we focused on uh, sort of landscape architecture, or not, sorry, not landscape architecture, but uh, plant life within architecture. And then uh, this, this particular poster on the right was uh, looking at chimneys. Um, uh, so the concept was well received but they really liked the idea of merging the two. Um, and then finally, what we came up with um, is what you see here and the subject matter, we really focused on, on stairs and, and looking at a sort of typical stock, uh, different types of stairs that one might see on a turbo squid type of site. Um, uh, the prominence of the microgramma uh, type space. And then um, we wanted to initially use Bible um, paper, uh, really thin, transparent, uh, translucent, uh, where you see front and back uh, really easily. Um, the printer down in Texas was too, he was a bit afraid that it might ruin uh, either their machines or ruin the paper. So we went with the stock a little bit more thicker than that, but still the idea of, of creating this transparency and, and, and overlaying of the two uh, topography content of the, of the, of the series and, and these renders. Um, that we actually rented from, from TurboSquid. Um, when I speak to uh, the idea of flatness here, I think for us, it was really the poster as an object itself is a, is a flat piece. Everything in our world has a thickness to it, of course, but uh, the idea of, of showing representation of 3D on a flat surface uh, was really appealing. And I think um, for us, um, uh, something that that we we deem successful and, and the university did too. Um, uh, a really fun process, and I think we have the full process and their feedback up on our Instagram um, uh, story highlights. If you wanted to go check that out, there's a little bit more in depth uh, story there. Um, another project, or these are two projects that I'm kind of combining today: uh, Holland Partners and Pandora Media. Pandora, the the music. Um, providing company and then Holland Partners is a, a research and advertise not advertising but they help um, Fortune 500 companies uh, investigate their consumers uh, understand who their consumers are so they're heavily into research and strategy um, we did the environmental gra graphics for both office spaces um, and I think what I like about these two projects and pairing them together is this side, oops, sorry, go. Uh, can you still see it or no? Yeah, we can see. Okay. Um, what I like about these two projects, it, it taps into the sensory idea and playing with the eye a bit and this idea of depth and flatness on one being a straight wallpaper, but we use um, Grasshopper and a few other programs to develop uh, what we call these clusters of information um, that are on the walls on the, on the left. And then uh, questioning the idea of flatness or depth with Pandora by highlighting a series of different, you know, uh, genre pushing um, musicians uh, in, through the representation of their, of their face through these, these louvers, which um, uh, I'll get more into. So the Holland Partners office, uh, basically down the hallways uh, as you enter this space and on some of the glass, we did these cl clusters, again, that are based on uh, different input information. So each one has a different size and shape, color um, that we inputted and, and created, uh, I think 117 different clusters um, and portrayed them around, around the office space. Um, a lot of the employees didn't know what they were and that, that really wasn't important uh, for us. But the idea of um, a flat wallpaper uh, but the renderings themselves um, really have this depthness to them when you're up close. It really does feel like it it's, has a dimensionality to it. Um, 
And then on the opposite side, when thinking about the Pandora office, uh, we were asked to create um, environmental graphics for two floors. Um, the longest span of wall in coordinating with the architects were, I think, 150 feet long, uh, where we created this series of louvers, which louvers is a, you know, a constant thing in architecture, but how could we um, trans transfix them into something um, that became sort of an image. Um, and in this case, you see janitor closet. So there's a, there's a series of different types of rooms. There's conference rooms, janitor closets, freight elevators, but they're all sort of hidden within this layer of popular musicians. So here you see Bob Marley in the forefront, uh, Billy Holiday in the back there. As you enter the hall and partner space, uh, we play with scale a lot and deafness of, within that scale. So some of the clusters are kind of blurry uh, within this wallpaper and then some are uh, what are to be seen as more in the forefront and, and crisp in their render. Um, and that, that is a, this, this network of information. Uh, so you see different scales as you walk around uh, the building's core. Here you see a preliminary uh, elevation of, of um, not only the, the different artists, but the sense of scale. Um, I mentioned that 150 feet long uh, hallway space. Um, so we had, you know, Gaga, um, Gene Simmons from, from Kiss, Diana Ross, The Beatles, Cher, and Miles Davis on, on um, uh, through these louvers. And the louvers are made out of one inch um, depth, uh, MDF board, and then the MDF is painted on the side to really highlight, um, um, to get rid of um, or enhance the image. I think if, if we didn't paint the MDF, that one inch um, depth would actually cause a bit of a conflict for the eye and it wouldn't be able to render the, the individual as well as it could. I think you can see a little bit um, uh, the issues that, that it would cause if we didn't paint the size of the, of the louver. So Jimi Hendrix at the reception desk. And then back to Holland Partners, again, looking, you can see it quite well on the, the far right, but the, the, the quality of render printed onto the wall paper substrate came out really amazing uh, being on site and seeing the inside, I couldn't believe how well they came out. Um, but there, that Christmas allowed the, the eye to think that those Hairy clusters were actually, to a degree, coming off, off the wall. Um, yes, yeah, Gene Simmons on the left, and then you can see on the right, um, through this layering, uh, uh, a lot of dialogue and coordination back and forth with the architects as far as even figuring out the distance, the distance between each louver. Um, that gap couldn't be too wide, couldn't be too short because we had um, these slow closing doors. Um, there was a series of doors that we had to worry about. So making sure that uh, we were fully um, engaged with, with their thinking um, on how to pull these off was um, quite a lot of, of work, um, a lot of back and forth and trial and error. Um, the next project I would like to talk about is City Game. It's sort of an in-betweener um, uh, when we talk about flat and deep. Um, for, well, the objective of City Game is an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York. Um, it's basketball in New York. Uh, every exhibition that happens at that museum, uh, New York is an essential um, part of the story. Uh, so for this exhibition, they tapped us probably because of our Nike work. Um, and for us, uh, I, uh, me especially, being a basketball player and fan, of the sport uh, was really struck by the amount of stories um, that the exhibition covered. Um, that was always a that's always a curation battle. But um, uh, but what is really interesting about New York City and, and basketball is the, the idea that every every race, every gender, um, is, gets tied to the to the to the sport. And and what the exhibition does quite well is it it brings those stories out either through video, imagery, um, text. Um, um, but yeah, uh, really a fun project that opened in February of 2020, closed down due to COVID and is now back open, uh, I believe for 
the full year of 2021. Um, so if you have a moment, uh, maybe go check it out um, if you're a fan of this sport. Um, the, the overall concept from a from a exhibition design point of view is um, the idea of flipping the role of the bleacher. Uh, the bleacher um, is always seen as the container for the spectator while the performer is in the center. Uh, with this exhibition, we flip that role where the performer are the bleachers and the spectators are in the center looking out. Uh, really simple, uh, but the idea is to recreate an arena, if you will. And then from a graphic point of view and this idea of flatness, uh, we were really inspired by um, one of my favorite artists, Solowit. Uh, he's kind of everyone's favorite, favorite artist. But um, uh, what you see there is variations of, of incomplete open cubes. Uh, we wanted to take the idea of looking at the basketball court lines in the same processes of um, you know, adding this idea of adding or subtracting to create a, seri a series of graphic um, elements that could be used on the walls, the floors, and even in the book. Uh, one thing that's constant uh, with, when it comes to basketball is the when you go to a court in the playground, in a gym, wherever, that the line is always two inches thick. Uh, so we wanted to maintain that. We designed the book for the exhibition too uh, through uh, Rizzoli. And in the book, the line is two inches. Within the exhibition, the line is two inches. Uh, so that's sort of our graphic uh, imprint. Um, and to main that, uh, maintain that consistency was, uh, was a must. Um, so as you enter the, the exhibition, you're hit with a big uh, title moment. And then as you enter the space, um, there's two entries to the space. And again, this idea of coming to an arena, we really wanted you to feel um, how the bleachers tapered down and um, as, uh, as the basketball players sort of enter out of the tunnel from the locker room into the, into the performance space. So here you can see uh, the level of content. Um, it starts in the early 1900s and, and works its way around the room to today. Um, and the exhibition, uh, you know, it's it's a constant push and pull of of imagery, video, um, uh, object. Uh, there's a lot of didactic information. Um, I, I think with exhibitions in, in in thinking about you know the museum in D.C. of course. Um, that battle seems to be always a constant. Is like the curators really want to pound the visitor with as much information as possible. And for me, a museum goer, a, a person who enjoys exhibitions, I always um, uh, enjoy the ones that are not trying to overbear um, the the audience. And um, you know, you win some and you lose some. But I think overall. Um, they did their due diligence. I think the, from a content point of view, um, the exhibition strikes a chord. Uh, and, and I think we had um, some New York Knicks come through, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came through and they praised it. So that was, that was a nice pat on the back uh, that we were able to walk away and feel good about. Um, again, thinking about line work and what is, what is flat and what is actually um, has depth and, and tangible. Uh, so the, the orange lines of the bleachers, the white lines of the bleachers play a part in how um, it's a continuation of this, of this um, line of the sport. Uh, and, and I'll speak to that again in a Nike project that's coming up. Um, but I think we want to elude the same thing, whether the idea is um, uh, that the idea should be tied to the game. Um, and it's upon us to how we manifested and I think the exhibition does a solid job of, of, of going back and forth, I, oscillating between the two. So um, the Nike New York headquarters project was completed in 2017. Uh, we work with Nike internal, um, mainly a, a creative director and, and friend Michael Spoljerek, who's from, from Queens, and he got assigned to the project and told us he had a doozy for us. We had done a lot of Nike work uh, up until this point, but uh, this is definitely the biggest project. Um, it's 150,000 square feet, six floors. And at the time that it opened, excuse me, there was only 150 people that were gonna be in the office. So you can imagine, you could basically go the whole day 
uh, and be left alone if you wanted to. Um, uh, each floor has a theme. Um, there was about, oh, and I should mention we work with Studios Architecture out of New York, uh, who, who handle all the architecture except for one moment that was left to us, which I'll show tonight as well. Uh, but in, in dialogue with them, with Michael, it's amazing in the sense of like really trying to figure out these moments where the architecture, architecture can just be the architecture or does it need to be enhanced um, through environmental graphics? Signage is signage, like that's another layer. But um, this idea of sort of like curating how one walks through the space, what slows them down, what speeds them up. Um, I think environmental graphics has a strong role in, in how people occupy or move through space um, and, and what sensations are we providing to them. And I think we got to do a lot of that within this project and it's something that we're really proud of. And I should mention um, that this went on to win, uh, I think a 2018 Arc Daily Interior Office of the Year, um, part of their Arc, Arc Daily Awards. Um, we didn't see that coming. That was huge for us and uh, yeah, pretty, pretty honored. Um, so um, Michael asked us to, to work on this project uh, we ended up creating a custom, a custom typeface for it. Um, and as I mentioned, every, every floor has a theme. And on this, uh, after the first floor, you saw the reception desk on the previous slide, you go up this grand stair uh, to the second floor and the second floor is theme. They, they call it multi-sport, but the basketball court lives. Um, I wish I could show you my mouse, but on the left image, on the right side of that image is a chain link fence. And, um, you know, one of the major overarching themes or guidelines that we try to stick to is um, how does new, the new Nike look at New York and then how does New York look at Nike? So it's always trying to take these different elements that exist in the city, the chain link fence that you would see at a, at a park, tiles that you would see in the subway, um, taking these smaller elements and enhancing them through a Nike lens, basically tying it to sport uh, if it isn't already. Um, so in the background, you see some illustrations on some tiles. We got to help Michael in, in curating, if we weren't doing the artwork ourselves, curating who would be um, the artist uh, chosen to work on particular moments. Uh, here you see Micah, he's an illustrator out of New York. Um, uh, the, the signs two and three are hand painted onto the concrete. The overall space is really gray, really white, really black, and there's only little moments of color. Um, this is something we argued back and forth with Michael on and lost that battle a, a few times, but um, and there's a custom typeface on the other side of that column on the right image. Um, and this idea of depth, deep and flat, I think it plays out pretty well in this bleacher that we designed. This is one of the things that we got to do that was um, really dimensional, three-dimensional. Um, and talking to Michael, he wanted the, the bleachers on the court to be um, very graphic. Uh, and working with a, a, one of my best friends, Corey, on, on the project, um, we talked about integration. Uh, we talk about integration through the signage as well. Uh, I'll get to it in the signage, but uh, the idea of, of the bleachers are going to need a structure. Can the structure be graphic? So what you're seeing in the, the, the gray is the metal structure that's holding up the, the bleacher. And then it lies flush, flat with the wood surface. Um, and you can see sort of a breakdown here. Um, this, is, um, this, this, this design really appeased Michael in the sense that it, it gave the sensation of a basketball net, if you can imagine. Um, but it also um, appeased us and it wasn't being so loud. It wasn't being so in your face, but it was just uh, a, a nice, a nice uh, uh, balance of, of both graphic and structure. Uh, the next slide is on the basketball floor, um, floor three. Um, on the right is on the same, uh, on floor two. It's behind the basketball court. There's a, sort of an homage to Nike running. Uh, so this is like the one moment that is not in New York. It's an homage to Portland, Oregon, or Beaverton, Beaverton, Oregon, where Nike's headquarters are. And that was their original logo, the O with the tree. And we got an artist to come etch out uh, the wood panels um, that you see. I, I, uh, 
my parents live in North Carolina and I found this company that I think they also did um, a wall surface at the new school. Um, so I found them and they happened to be in North Carolina. So for Thanksgiving, when I went to go visit my parents, I went to their warehouse and handpicked each panel, um, fun background, um, but getting an artist to etch out the logo. Uh, we have like a stop motion video that was just pretty cool. But, uh, on, and then on the right, it being the basketball floor, Michael Jordan, uh, the free throw line dunk uh, within the kitchen, on the kitchen tiles. Um, and then again, thinking about deep and flat within each conference room, conference rooms are named after particular shoes. Uh, on the left is the hyper dunk conference room is the biggest conference room in the, in the, um, in the office. And on the right is the hyper dunk, um, oh, sorry, sorry. The Air Force One is on the left. The hyper dunk is on the right. Um, we, uh, we took, uh, we found this company in China that does um, these sound deafening um, um, panels uh, to control the sound within the rooms and each one uh, of the conference rooms, those, those tiles are, are, are showing the soles of those shoes. Um, really subtle, um, but plays a nice strong role within, within the conference room. And again, thinking about the lines of the sport that you saw in City Game, this was sort of, um, City Game came after this, so that was an extension of this, but thinking about the lines of the sport through this idea of like hieroglyphics in a way, or, you know, the tile, which is usually a flat thing to, for, the, for the most part, uh, how could we um, make that a little bit more dynamic seen through a Nike lens and, and this idea of taking the lines of the sport and protruding it out to the, to the, to the user, to the visitor um, became appealing. Uh, so what you're seeing here is just different symbols, different lines of the game, uh, whether it be from the court, the basketball itself, the hoop, the shoes, what have you. Uh, and we did the same thing on the fourth floor for the running, um, the running floor. As I mentioned, we designed a custom typeface and then within that typeface, um, the, the, the signage system uses this idea of series of lines sometimes to represent floor, but other times it's just um, what we saw as a nice graphic element. And in that graphic element to the left of every, every black line lives the braille. And braille is not needed on every sign, but we, for ADA purposes, it's not needed on every sign, but we actually use it on every sign. Um, it just felt uh, like a really nice way to integrate ADA. Uh, oftentimes when you go to buildings, it's always seen as an afterthought. You can tell it's not really, um, uh, full integration and I think we want to change that and I think every time we take on a signage project is rethinking how can ADA um, signage really um, influence um, for lack of a better word the regular signage um, yeah so a uh, custom typeface that only Nike can use uh, developed in-house um, on the left is Adrian. Uh, he actually did design the typeface. Um, and the, the, the tiles that you see behind him are the running tiles. So just taking again lines from the sport. Um, we worked with um, actually an illustrator slash architect. She just finished up at Snowheada. Her name is Carolina Muscasco um, from Portugal, but she was New York based. She, she did the whole um, soon the whole marathon, New York City marathon, uh, here you're seeing it in the, at Central Park, but she draws everything in AutoCAD. So we're talking about millions and millions of line work. Um, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, so this is in one of the working booths within, within the office. Uh, I'm gonna show you a quick video that's like a roundup uh, of everything I just talked about. Um, enjoy. <laughs> So um, yeah, that's um, 
Bitch Don't Kill My Vibe by Sly Fifth Avenue, instrumental, really nice rendition. Um, that, that last image within that video is the, the Nike swoosh on, on the sixth floor deck that, um, you know, if you're living in the apartment above, it's sort of like Nike statement that they've, they've entered the, the neighborhood. And, um, you know, the whole impetus for Nike actually getting its own space, it was in, in the Google building in the meatpacking district for a long time and Google was expanding and kicked everyone out and, and Nike found that building um, in Koreatown. Uh, I think it's on 31st or 32nd, 6th Avenue. Uh, but yeah, that was sort of the, the full run through of, of, of the Nike project. Um, but thank you for, for your time and I hope you got something good out of this. I think the worst part of doing um, Zoom um, talks is that you can't hear the roaring applause that's happening <laughs> right now. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm so, I was so excited to see your work and I'm so thrilled that, that you know, I, I'm able to see it, but also the students were able to, um, to be here and, and hear more about your, um, your work. And, you know, of course the work speaks for, your, speaks for, for, for itself um, and we can, you know, go to your website and you have, you know, you've presented at other events, but really to see, even to see something that's actually in, in progress, I think is such a privilege and to actually understand where, you, where you're coming from and there's sort of the hidden um, message, um, quite literally like a hidden message. I think yeah. it's, it's so, so powerful. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think what we um, what we're gonna do is open um, open it up for, you know, maybe just a couple of um, uh, questions um, from the from the student body. Um, but uh, maybe I'll actually start um, by asking you something that I sort of I was curious about because I think you know as I mentioned in the in the introduction, um, one of the things I think is is notable about you and your relationship to the work and, and, and your background is that you were actually trained as an architect, right? Um, and, and you've actually uh, worked at a few different architecture studios before founding your, co-founding your own studio with your partner. Um, and, you know, I, I actually really love the quote that you have on your website, which actually you refer to at the beginning of the talk. I'm really glad that you did that because it was something that I definitely noticed when I was looking at your website. Um, and this idea that, you know, as humans, we should be able to do it all. Um, this kind of aspirational idea that like we should be able to change nappies, but also we should be able to give orders and program computers and, you know, um, empathize with other human beings. I think this is especially resonant right now in this moment. Um, and and I think architects are trained that way. I think you also alluded to that with um, Rem Kohlhaas's quote too. And you know, architects are trained to really be sort of uh, skilled in all these different ways, um, not just visual people, but also to think logically, to think historically, um, to think about theory and you know other and cultures and contexts and all of these things. Um, and when you look back to being, if you can, if you look, look back to um, you as a as a very young designer just coming out of school and having all of this education and all of these influences. Also, you had mentioned that you grew up in New York, which is a very special place because I think so much happens in the city that there's also this kind of inherent um, sort of pressure to know everything, be everywhere, do everything, be interested in everything, go to all the shows. Um, yeah. But when when you were young and you were just coming out of architecture school, I wonder like which skills and interests really served you well and now looking back which skills and interests you felt feel like you lacked and you wish you had just as you know as a young person so i'll say uh the gift of gab um is is one of the things that um I, i'm not i don't have the presence of, of someone like um I don't know, maybe like a Bjarke Engels or something that really knows how to talk and speak and really sell a, sell a, sell a design. But I think architecture school really did open the door for me able to feel comfortable talking to people and not being shy away from that. And talking to my wife, you know, her graphic design program, they didn't have juries, they didn't have, you know, verbal presentations like that. And it, it worked out really well in, in, in my advantage to, to at least have um, that, that ability, I don't know if I wasn't good at it, but I feel like that was a strong takeaway for me. Um, in the in the sense that I know that I was going to have my I, I wanted my own studio, and that was going to be a strong component was being able to talk to the client. Um, 
surprisingly, I don't know if that surprises you, but uh, for me, yeah, the, the be, being able to, to verbalize um, what you're trying to address, what you're trying to convey uh, was, was huge. And I think that was one of the biggest takeaways I got out of coming out of Kent State um, uh, and entering the workforce. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's actually a really valuable thing that students um, in some ways are, are sort of, you know, forced to reckon with when they're at school, right, to present your ideas. In, yeah. And also, you know, with a little bit of added pressure, I think that's super amazing and helpful training for, you know, for what, you, what you have to do in the real world. I think so much of it, it doesn't matter how amazing and how talented you are, if you can't communicate that, then, you know, not a lot of people will get to know it. Um, so in that way, you know, I think we, I, I can completely um, align with, you know, with, with, uh, with your thoughts there. Um, and, and just to go back to, you know, I had mentioned your website before and, you know, what to me, what was super memorable about, memorable about your website um, is the landing page, mm -hmm. because I think landing pages used to be a thing, um, you know, there were technical reasons why landing pages existed, but you know a lot of websites actually don't use that idea anymore. But I think it's actually really a strong and um, interesting stance that you have as a studio to have this landing page. And I think there's like several important things that come up for me on that landing page. One, it sort of reinforces your sort of quote unquote brand um, in a really smart and layered way because you talk about okay, what is we should do it all. What like what is all? So you start to define what that all is, and some of it is related to medium, some of it is related to content, some of it's just attitudinal. I think it's brilliant that you know it just if you haven't looked at it, you guys should all go and see it. Um, I think it's really nice that you play, play with language, and it's not you know it's not graphic design in in the most kind of obvious way, but I think it's actually a really powerful graphic design. Um, but, you know, and because the students are now thinking about portfolios and how they represent themselves as individuals and designers, you know, um, whether it's a book or a kind of a digital portfolio, there's always this idea of the cover, right? Like, what is the thing, that, like that first page that represents the, 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 the object or the, um, the volume? And in some ways, like your landing page is kind of a cover on the website. So I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about that um like what is an important cover and what should it communicate like how much should it communicate what should it communicate if you were looking at some somebody's book or portfolio or pdf or something what you know what would you look for in a cover yeah a uh, really good question and um and thank you for the compliments i i feel like one of the reasons why we wanted to go that route for the for the website is one it's ran it's on random so i feel like i get away we can get away with a lot when it's on random and you can okay. cycle through something but when it comes to something that's really static for me i tend to go all type route as like a by default um because i i really don't want to put the weight of a project over another like i i view them as all of our our babies and you know if you're asking me to choose what my favorite one i couldn't tell you so I, that's where i feel like t the type route is a is a safer route to go um um but that that's kind of look if you're at if you have an image on the cover like that in, is something that has to knock your socks off it, for me i think um uh, when it comes to student work, um, this is not across the board or universal rule, but it, it's, um, I think if you can ex express something through words, through your name, how the type of topography is laid out, I'd be, that to me is by default more, more appealing. Um, uh, and then I think, and it also takes some pressure off. I feel like, you know, that's, you know, um, as you mentioned, like the, the, the cover is, we put such weight to it and mm -hmm. you know like that that first impression is huge so um it's a way to like settle people in uh if we go the topography route i think um, yeah i hope i answered your question <laughs> yeah no totally i think cover is such a such a tricky thing one of the things that i always tell my students is design the cover at the end so that it you know you know yeah. what the thing is 
and then you know how to talk about mm -hmm. it or package it as opposed to yeah. because I think oftentimes I think you can off you can sort of fall into this trap of well a cover has to look like a cover and the inside is a cover and separating those two things yeah. but I think that, that you know they have to be really integrated and, and thought of together so I, my advice is like to think of it you you can design it first but you should always come back to it and think does this make sense with what, yeah. what else is happening for, um, for city, city games I already cut you off for we did the book for Rizzoli and um, the director of Rizzoli was adamant about having an old New York Nick on the cover, but we we're saying like the audience is much bigger than the '70s New York Knicks. Like we need to find some someone new, someone fresh. We lost the battle, but um, but yeah, uh, like one we were pushing for all type cover, but they said it had to have an image for selling purposes. Right, and then they hit us with the selling purposes again. Like people know Wolf but they don't they wouldn't know these two kids playing in the parks and that's how we lost but yeah um but yeah it, it's it, it's it's the constant battle yeah and and in a little bit related to that i mean you must because you're in a studio and you've done this for many years now you must receive so many emails and portfolios from young designers graduating students people just you know want a job and or just like want to chat with you guys or whatever um do you i'm just curious because you know where we have a studio but we're you know much more sort of traditionally graphic design you're um more multifaceted than, than, than us in many ways i'm one so i assume that you had you um garner interest from different types of designers like yeah. architectural designers graphic designers maybe even product designers um do you notice the difference in the way that those different designers communicate like through their portfolio, portfolios, emails, CVs? Yeah, I, I think there's a slight difference. Um, I mean, right off the bat, if, it, if it's an architecture student, I'm, I'm thinking about how strong their graphics are. Because <laughs> in our studio, you will be doing graphic design. Um, you're doing a graphic design in an architecture studio anyway, but I'm talking about like you're actually doing it for someone else. like. Like there's 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 um, there's something at stake, <laughs> um, um, so we're looking at that right away. Um, and on the graphic design side, I'm uh, I'm I'm looking for if there's any type of hybridity to their work. Um, we're really looking for what we call the chameleon. Um, there, there seems to be very few out there, but um, we also believe as a studio that we should be trying to train them as to be chameleons and uh, Chris, uh, who I presented in the beginning on our on our team slide, trained as an architect, but we're, we're, we're he's interested in graphic design and we're working him in to become more uh, of a graphic designer. And then anyone in our studio who like wants to do more exhibition design from a physical point of view, like we, we want to slowly um, train those people. We think it's it's vital. If if we're if we're not finding what we're looking for, then let's take the time to actually develop the type of people that we that we need. Um, so that's that's something that's happening in, in the studio. But um, yeah, there are subtle differences. But um, yeah, and and I would say also maybe as a tip, like we do get I do get this quite a bit. Is like can we can I sit down for coffee with you? In a in a in a in a perfect world, yes, you could, but it. If you took a different approach where maybe you you and five other friends wanted to talk to a, a someone that someone's like so a person that you like their work and could see yourself working for maybe gather a group of people and complete that ask i feel like i feel like um i'd be more committed to it if, it, if it's more of a not a full-on class it could be but I just feel like one-on-one -on -one is asking a lot uh and we do get that quite a bit so that's why i'm putting that shot out there um, my wife is giving me the, the white flag so <laughs> <laughs> i think that's actually really good advice i've never thought of that but um yeah especially you know as a, as a parent of young children time is of, you know, <laughs> su of such value i know this too so i think that's really good advice yeah. thank you so much again for making time on a saturday evening it was i mean for me it was it was so great to see your work and i'm sure i can't wait to discuss it with my students too um late, uh, next week thank you so much thank you so much um take care everybody and thank you again for for coming out on a saturday night Welcome back, everyone. I'm really, really pleased to introduce Jian Rim tonight um, for our second part of the talk. Jian is an associate design director at 2x4, and she works on branding, brand activation, and publication projects for a diverse set of cultural and corporate clients, such as Prada, um, 
Knoll, Glenstone Museum, and Princeton University, among many, many others. Um, she's received her MFA in graphic design from Yale University School of Art and a BA from Williams College. Before joining 2x4, she, was, she worked as an art director at Barney's New York and maintained an independent design practice with clients including the MoMA, the Met, Art Sanjay Center, and the Bard Center for the Curatorial Studies. She has taught senior thesis in communications design at Parsons and also co-taught graphic narratives here at Columbia with Michael Rock. Um, and during her tenure at 2x4, Gian has worked with a very impressive list of clients and produced some really beautiful and smart work. Um, as many of you all know that, you know, 2x4 is a design agency uh, based in New York that, that really just disregards the separation of, of various creative disciplines. It's, you know, it's truly a multidisciplinary studio. And so as a design director at a, and a leader of a team, Gian's job isn't just simply to give something form, but rather harnessing and guiding every aspect of design process from research to strategy, from concepting to production, from you know, experiencing something on, an, on a small mobile screen to experiencing a built environment and so on. But today she'll talk through how attitude becomes form, which by the way, was, um, was the title of a, of a seminal 1969 exhibition at the Bern Kunsthal which was then recreated and revisited in 2013 um, at the Fondazione Prado in Venice. Um, Gian will show and discuss a range of books as examples that demonstrate how an idea, a vision, a stance, an epoch, an attitude finds form and becomes a comprehensive and comprehensible object. Thank you so much for coming, Gian. Jun Jay, thank you so much for that intro. <laughs> uh, thanks again for the invitation. And also, I just wanted to thank Jonathan, who I don't know if he's still on here, but for uh, such a great presentation. It was really interesting to see. Um, so I'll just get started as Jun Jay um, introduced this title. You, uh, some, of me, some of you may recognize this title that I freely borrowed from that exhibition that Yun Jay mentioned of the same name, curated, curated by Harold Seidman in 1969. As designers, we often talk about form and content or form and concept, but not so much attitude or tonality really, even though it's such a fundamental quality. And attitude and tonality is often considered an outcome or an effect rather than something that can be designed to. And what I'm going to focus on today is looking at ways that something abs as abstract and as ineffable as attitude or personality or style, I'll be using some of those words interchangeably, is translated into design and more specifically in book or presentation format. Um, it was just interesting to, you know, hear um, Yoon Jae's kind of intro into the bio um, to start with, because really what we're thinking about today, I think is a little bit thinking about how you want to characterize your own work, sort of how you synthesize that into language and also of course into graphic form. You're representing your projects really in this portfolio project. So thinking about how you want to characterize that is really the essence of sort of what we're looking at today. So I will advance this. So this is the Myers-Briggs personality chart. Again, that many of you might be familiar with. It organizes personalities into 16 core types based on four binary vectors. This has become a really popular kind of internet quiz. So many of you may have taken it before. Those four vectors are introversion, extroversion, intuition, sensing, thinking, feeling, perceiving, and judging. So these they categorize these along those four vectors. And this chart then maps certain personality traits onto those combination of vectors. So on the upper left-hand corner, you have the INTJ personality type that supposedly has imagine is a personality that is imaginative strategic organized on the lower right hand corner someone who is extroverted sensing feeling and um, perceptive and that personality type they've assigned the qualities of being spontaneous energetic and enthusiastic so whether or not you really agree with these exact category categorizations I think it's really easy to recognize and identify with yourself like with one of one or more of these personality traits of course like the two that I pointed out for example are on opposite ends of the spectrum so here this particular chart actually happened to assign titles to each type as well so that upper left hand corner is actually the INTJ which apparently has the personality profile of an architect <laughs> 
This is a comic by Matt Grenning that's outlining 81 types of high school students. Again, really similar to that Myers-Briggs chart that we just looked at. There's a whole gamut of personalities here. So the outcast, cheerleader, young Republican, hippie poet, and kind of like horoscopes or the Myers-Briggs chart. There's something really intuitive and visceral about these assignations. And usually a few that resonate with you, you kind of you know, look at this chart and you immediately go back and sort of identify with one or more of these types. And I thought, looking at this range of personalities or spectrum of personalities can be a really useful tool and an entryway into thinking about attitudes or tonalities in regards to your own work. So just when you are beginning sort of this process, I think what you kind of want to do is almost do a psychoanalysis, if you will, if you take that metaphor further of those personality types of what your own work is like. Again, when you go back to that Myers-Briggs chart or those um, 81 high school typologies, what, it, what are the quality, chief qualities of your work and what kind of best captures it? Or sometimes it's the quality of your work or perhaps it's also having to do with the process of your own, your, the creative process of your work. I find it's usually best to do this exercise with language. I think this kind of relates back to actually what Jonathan was talking about with his um, website landing page and some of those questions that Yoon Jae was raising. Sometimes language can be a really useful tool just to think through those qualities without any visual ideas attached to them. So these are not necessarily binary values. It's not that you actually have to be, you know, at one pole or the other, but they're useful ways of thinking through where you are on the spectrum of these qualities or where your work lies in the spectrum of these qualities. Again, you know, the personality or tonality of your work might be completely different from like your um, personality type as uh, assigned by Myers-Briggs. So some of those qualities that I thought I would just go through that are really immediate and kind of, um, you know, really resonant, exuberant or understated, maximal or minimal, something that's monolithic or something that's more heterogeneous and multiple, something that's really raw versus something refined, something a quality of playfulness versus something very serious or perhaps academic, something that's mass versus something that's precious, something that's default versus something that's utterly unique and bespoke. So again, something to think about, some of the qualities that you might want to write down as you kind of begin to think about how to translate some of these qualities into visual form. So of course, these logos, I think, will be very familiar to you. And without even knowing anything about either of these entities, I think just from the form of qualities of these logos, you understand what their persona is. Some of sort of what I'm talking about today actually lies at the very heart of kind of how we begin a branding process as well. It's really about pinning down what those qualities are and then trying to translate them into visual form. So here, just a simple um, kind of curvilinear typography with you know, bright, cheerful, childlike colors on the left for Google. And then these kind of jagged letter forms and having you know, primarily black with white typography knocked out really gives you immediately without knowing anything about these entities a sense of what their personalities are like or how they're trying to convey themselves. So again, attitude is something that's, I think, informed really by everything. So all aspects of form and content are really contributing towards it. If you think about it in relation to that personification metaphor that I began, began with, it's like asking what contributes to your personality. It's how you act, what you say, how you dress really, you know, in total everything. So of course we, you know, you're familiar with the two categories that we often talk about in design, form and content. And my understanding is that this year actually, of course, size, format and materiality, since um, you will be kind of submitting these um, final portfolios in a digital form, those don't um, relate as much, but I will be talking about some of the formal qualities and um, specific examples that I'll be showing you just because it's such a powerful um, way of communicating certain ideas, typography, the typeface itself, the size, the letting, 
of course, the typesetting, whether it's center, it's justified, it's ragged. These are really kind of simple vectors which can become really useful tools. Um, imagery, the scale and density and the placement of it, the use of white space, and then cover and title pages, again, as um, sort of came up in the previous discussion, something that's a really powerful and kind of the most condensed form in which you know you want to kind of characterize yourself intro pages table of contents and finally chapter dividers and really i would say when i approach a project something like a publication project or even a presentation things like the intro pages the table of contents and the chapter dividers really become tools um, through sketching that like help to develop the language that you're trying to establish and those are the really the core um, kind of design components that you want to take a look at. And then, of course, looking at content, text, the tone and style of language, what exactly that kind of language or that voice is. First, it could be first person, an analytical report, manifesto, poem, large, single, punctuated words, or a long form essay. Of course, there's an endless variety of tone of voices in which that text can take shape. And then again, of course, the quality of the images themselves, whether they're renders, process sketches, drawings, models, what kind of color application is applied to these images. And finally, sequence and organization, which is really you know, deeply tied to form and can't be separated out from it. But whether it's chronological, alphabetical, small to big, of course, those have really you know, larger implications on what the narrative of the whole piece is, um, putting those things together. But again, form and content come together really to kind of form a general attitude and these smaller decisions all contributing towards that larger tonality. So what I thought I would do today is walk you through a few books um, that have very different attitudes and carefully look at and analyze some of the key design components so that you could better understand how a certain attitude and tonality is achieved so the first publication I'm looking at is called The Production Line of Happiness and some of the characteristics that this publication has and with the work that it's representing are, is clinical, flat, and generic. So this is the exhibition. Uh, oops, sorry, just going back for one sec. This, the, this first book is the exhibition catalog, again, for Christopher Williams's work. He's a conceptual photographer whose work critically examines the production of commercial photography and consumer culture. In a lot of ways, his work is about making photographic conventions that we've become accustomed to visible. This image here in the middle is actually a kind of cutaway of a camera body. So it's a sort of really simple, you know, visual metaphor for like his whole body of work. So this is the exhibition catalog for his retrospective at MoMA. When you, you know, encounter a book, of course, in real life, one of the first things you notice is its physicality, its materiality, its size and weight. And of course, in this case, what really grabs your attention right away is the bright yellow color stock that wraps around the soft cover and the amount of text on the cover. It has the size and weight sort of an instruction manual or a technical document, something more like you, you know, a document that might be printed at Kinko's than really what you conceive of as a tr traditional exhibition catalog. So here you see the front and back covers. On the right, the front cover is explaining in minute detail the functionality of barcode and IS and of the barcode and ISBN number that accompanies all published books. And actually, barcodes and ISBN numbers are conventionally, you know, on the back side of um, covers. And then the back cover here displays the logos of the publishing institution, and it goes into minute detail about the brand guideline, uh, guidelines that are dictating their application. So here again, the designers are playing with the form. We'll here the designers playing with the formal conventions of a book and bringing attention to elements like the barcode, the ISBN number logos that we usually take for granted. So in that way, it, the book already suggests it's, it's itself as an extension of Williams's own artwork practice. 
this very poor scan, some reason it's, it's looking very low res here. Um, this is actually the title page. So there's a few things that are really unusual about this title page compared to a conventional title page. The first thing is like the size of the title, which is of course extremely small. Then it prominently features all the collaborators and the institutions involved. It also might be hard to see here, but it has a page number on the upper right hand corner, which is highly unusual for something like uh, either a cover, a title page or a chapter divider, which are usually treated more as like special display pages. But again, I think all those um, little design gestures combined to call our attention to some of the conventions of um, book design that we normally don't pay, don't pay attention to. This is one of the um, first spreads that um, has the curator's essays here. So here right away, you can see the typography is almost entirely set in neutral sans serif typeface at one size with a considerable line measure, like saying that the line length is quite long. The title is the same size as the body copy, giving it the feeling of a document. And there's almost no hierarchy which I would say usually is a bad thing, but in this case, it really gives the impression in a deliberate way of something being undesigned. Then in a little bit more detail, of course, looking at the typography that's been chosen in particular, this um, very neutral sans serif typeface, I think it might be something like Swiss 721, but again, a really kind of neutral or utilitarian typeface chosen to really convey this utilitarian um, tonality of the publication as a whole. So in addition to the essays by the curators, there's texts by filmmakers, poets, and other artists who Williams has identified as having a similar approach to his own work. And on the right are actually a set of rules for even designing exhibition catalogs. So his interest again in sort of really laying bare conventions is clear in sort of the, the other artists that he includes in the catalog as well. And in addition to different types, of, but even though there's different types of content type, typographically they're treated very similarly. There's a flatness overall to the hierarchy on each page when you look at these three sample spreads. And that's also true throughout the book. There's this kind of relentless flatness to this book. And again, generally, I would say that's something that you we don't look for as designers. We often talk about creating hierarchy and clarity and chapter dividers are a really important function in a really important way within the structure of a book. But in this case, this is a deliberate design um, strategy to kind of eliminate um, any of those kinds of conventions. So here, instead of in a conventional chapter divider, actually these yellow pages of stock have been inserted in between the sewn signatures of the book. And again, I think this gesture is something that's really physical when you physically encounter the book is something that's really immediate and makes the reader aware of the construct the way that a book is constructed. So the fact that these yellow um, sheets of stock act as a chapter dividers and are ins inserted makes you kind of interrogate the structure of the form of the book. One thing um, you saw sort of in a sam these sample spreads here that I showed is that there's actually absolutely no color reproductions of the work that have been featured in the exhibition. It's pretty much the, the entire, almost the entirety of the book is black and white, mostly te very text heavy. And at the very end, there is a supplement, um, the smaller um, stapled booklet that's inserted into the back of the book that shows thumbnails and with the re color reproductions of the artworks that are featured in the retrospective. So again, this decision to kind of deliberately not follow the convention where you think of it, an exhibition catalog as having kind of large scale, full color photographs uh, like that reproduce the artwork. He kind of undermines that intention and then just inserts these at, this at the end as a footnote. So moving on to this kind of second case study. So here we're looking at a publication that has a really different tonality. So here the tonality is bold, exuberant, playful. And I'm sure this is an example that many of you may recognize. 
it's the book Yes is More, the, an ARC comic um, by um, Big. So this, com this is a comic book manifesto. There's some ways in which I tried to avoid showing this book as an example, just because it's, I feel like it's often cited, but it's hard to be in terms of its utter clarity of intention. It's a larger size soft cover book with a vinyl coating, kind of like a trade paperback. It's black, it's floppy, it's glossy. And on the cover, you see this dramatically lit cityscape populated with big projects with this giant swashy type in motion. So of course, right away, it's kind of unmistakable what they're going for with the tone of the book. Here, this is one of the opening spreads, which of course, shows a series of figures like Mies van der Rohe, Venturi, Philip Johnson, Rem Koolhaas, and Obama sort of declaring their manifestos in these comic book bubbles. And this puts Bjork at Engels in their company. And he really captures his amb ambition for the book in situating himself amongst these figures as well. And it just becomes a very playful and also like easy way to enter into the book. This is um, maybe the third or fourth spread when you first um, open the cover. I think the front matter of the book, as I kind of stated earlier, is a really useful opportunity for setting the stage or establishing your intent. And I think this book really does that so successfully on the cover. It really declares its intent. And here in the first opening pages, of course, they really clearly state here that their goal is to transmit the energy of a in real life conversation with an architect. And of course, the great thing about a comic book form is how well suited it is to giving content a sense of energy and movement. So here very deliberately, they state their intent and they sort of um, you know, rigorously go about executing it in, throughout the book. This is the TOC, which is organized by project. Each one's uh, presented as an episodic vignette with those abstract icons representing each one. The titles in terms of language are also really playful. You have here the Spanish steps, which are the, like the SP is then crossed out and becomes the Danish steps or a use of alliteration in many of the titles like modular mania or Scandinavian skyscraper. Of course, they could have titled these simply by the site and a more kind of neutral title for the projects, but instead they kind of have a lot of them employ kind of play on words, um, which I think adds to the general, of course, um, contributes to the overall tonality of playfulness and brashfulness um, of the book overall. And again, as you can kind of sense from the uh, uniformity of the typography here, there's no beginning, middle or end. You really can flip to enter the book at any point and, and um, to whichever page you would like. This is a chapter divider for the first project. And again, every here, every project is introduced with a full bleed image on a double spread. It's title set in all caps. Swat, that swashy comic book type with that key icon that represents the project. With all the variation and the content and layouts, a consistent chapter divider helps to give some structure to the book. And really, again, it's sort of, I would consider chapter dividers formally to be sort of something like the skeleton or the bones of your, of your design project or your portfolio project it really helps you you know, give it the structure that's needed to give some sort of sense of consistency throughout. So here the comic book form is, you know, again, something that's inherently dynamic, configurations of the frame change on every page, and it's visually really dense. Of course, it's, you know, one of the great things about it is how endlessly elastic it is. Drawings, photographs, renders, everything is kind of freely mashed up together to give it a really varied texture. So the next project I'm going to show again has a really different tonality from the last two projects I showed. This one's much more intimate, personal, has a kind of a narrative or storybook um, feeling to it. 
And this is a publication by 51N4E, which I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, um, Architecture Studio, called Reasons for Walling a House. So here again, just starting with the physicality of the book. Um, this book is about an intervention on a residential house by 51N4E and the guests who were then invited to stay within it. It's on the smaller side, really, with a plot like a pliable soft cover. It's got rounded cut corners, a painted edge. There's something kind of really intimate and nice about the scale of the book. Here you might be able to see the texture of the cover. It's bound in coated library cloth. So the cover is plain, the title's small with everything left in lining. There's a feeling of kind of sophisticated simplicity just because the design is is fairly simple, but then the materiality is special. So this is the first spread when you open the book. There is, of course, you know, a expanse of white space with a delicate title centered on the right-hand page, and I think it just—it's very immediate. You don't even think about um, sort of the experience. It just sets a clear tone. It's contemplative. It's quiet. The white space. In this case, I think really relates to a white metal ball, a white uh, metal wall that was also built around the structure of the house. This is a spread actually immediately following that preceding spread, and it just has a single small inset image like a window, which I think is a view from the house. Again, that white expanse of white space creates a sense of quiet and that of the book kind of, you know, revealing itself really slowly. So again, a really different approach um, from what you saw in the opening pages of um, Big's book, where it really kind of starts off with a bang. Here, this is just a diagram outlining the content of each chapter. So this is this book is organized by guests. Again, this is a residential project where guests were then invited to come stay at the house and do sort of their own intervention within the house. So each chapter is for each person who was invited, architects, designers, artists, or writers that came and interacted with the house in some way. And so each chapter contains different types of content. So guest one, there was an interview. Guest two, a personal essay. Then there's also dialogues and photos. Um, guest five is an architect. So there's architectural drawings and photos and stories. So a whole range of different types of content segregated into these various chapters. So then looking at, these are some sample spreads from those chapters and looking at formally sort of how to create consistency and coherence throughout while, you know, without becoming overly repetitive and boring. I think that's a real trick of publication or even presentation design is that you wanna create a sense of continuity, but of course, just doing the same thing over and over becomes incredibly redundant. So here, the same um, serif typeface is used throughout, throughout each section, but it's typeset differently. Again, sort of matching, you know, what fits the content. So here, guest one, you have that interview, it's two columns, much smaller typeface. Going to guest two, you have a justified block of text. It actually, you know, each chapter is using the same serif typeface throughout. For, for all of the content, but in this case, it's justified and larger with a larger margin inset. If you go to guest four, for example, that's a dialogue. It's kind of like it reads as a play with a smaller inset image facing it. So again, a way to create continuity is using that same typeface, but really in it modulating its use and just typesetting it differently to create some variety. This is an example of one of the chapter dividers. So again, as I mentioned earlier, chapter dividers are really important navigational devices that help guide the reader. And they also establish a kind of structure and rhythm to the book. They operate again as a kind of frame for the content to hang on to. So in this book, the chapter dividers are styled as log entries for each guest. So it's essentially templated this same um, kind of log entry format is repeated for each chapter. 
And in this case, you can kind of see this is a different sans serif typography used for these chapter dividers. And you see the sans serif typography uh, in use here and then also at the front of the book. So in some ways, there are two different typographic voices in this book, a sans serif and a sans. And the sans typography really represents the voice of the book and then the serif typography representing the voice of the guest. This is a sample spread from one of the chapters. Here, I just wanted to show really some simple gestures such as the size of a margin and the size and placement of a block of text. You know, centering that with lots of white space can create a tonality in itself. It's incredibly simple. It's really about the deployment of white space and the kind of precise and thoughtful placement of certain items. So here right away, without reading the text, you get a sense that this is a short story, which is um, this section has photographic imagery along with kind of um, fictional stories created about these locations within the town. And again, thinking about what kind of content to include in this case is the hand drawing you know, of a um, proposed intervention and the way in which the simple hand drawing and the kind of amount of white space that's given to it just gives it the feeling of something very personal, quirky and kind of intimate. So I'm um, moving on to the last project here. This is actually a project that I worked on. So this is a project that is maybe a little bit closer to the tonality of the project that we just looked at, but something that's precious, archival and crafted. And this is a publication that I made a two by four along with um, some other designers for Wes Anderson and Juman Malouf. So to start with there, these are two different publications for the same exhibition. Again, that was curated by Wes Anderson and his partner, Juman Malouf. And it's kind of a useful example of the interpretive role that graphic design can play. So the first exhibition opened at the Kunsthistorische Museum Wien in Vienna. <laughs> Not sure how you say that. Um, and then later traveled and was restaged at Fondazione Prada in Milan a year later. So for the exhibition, Anderson and Malouf spent time coming through the archives of KHM and the National History Museum in Vienna handpicking and organizing items into their personal collections. So on the left is a standard exhibition catalog that was produced for the first iteration of the show. And on the right is an artist book that I worked on a two by four with a group of designers, including uh, Chae Jin Yi and Chase Booker, um, Sung Kim and Michael Rock, amongst others, of course, being a you know, collaborative studio, we ha often have interns and other people who are helping on this project as well in various roles. So this is showing a couple spreads actually from that exhibition catalog that was on the left. Again, so this that catalog was designed by a different studio and was tied to that first iteration of the exhibition in Vienna. So inside there are large full color images of the artworks with the object captions face on the facing page. The chapters are organized and color coded by the collections as, as they are organized in the exhibition. And I think what this enabled us to do was to propose something um, very different from an, a standard exhibition catalog because it already existed. Often the pressure would be to kind of feature all of the artworks that are within the exhibition as this is done here. But because this publication had already existed, it really gave us the freedom to do something much more interpretive for this, the second iteration of the exhibition. So this image here is actually kind of the keystone image that was one of the artworks in the first exhibition. So the title of this piece is Chamber of Art and Curiosity by friends Frank and the Younger. And right away we thought this is a kind of image that um, kind of is a key to the rest of the exhibition in the sense of the exhibition as a whole being a cabinet of curiosities. 
So we began to kind of explore this idea of how to interpret the idea of cabinet of curiosities, which is kind of the approach, the curatorial approach of um, Wes Anderson and Juman and the other curators as well is, is what we came to realize. And of course we were um, immediately thought of Duchamp's Boite en Valise as well as something that is kind of like a more modern interpretation of what a, a cabinet of wonder could be in a kind of graphic form. So here, this is the resulting publication that we made, again, for that um, restaging of the exhibition in Milan. So here on the left is the kind of exterior case that is has the impression of a kind of um, book, but is actually a portfolio case, which holds inside of it several items um, that you can kind of see more clearly here. So again, the idea here was to create a graphic interpretation of a cabinet of curiosities. We created eight separate components, a small book that contained curators' interviews, drawings, and an index of all the objects in the exhibition, a transcription of a conversation, that's the yellow um, file um, booklet there, an accordion book that represented the exhibition of the design, which is that black booklet, a poster showcasing all, um, I think it was 593 objects that fit um, into this cloth covered case. And then in addition to that, there's also a set of postcards. There's this recipe here that um, had to do with um, one of the treats that was offered in the cafe. And then there were actually also two slide transparencies that all fit into this archival box. So this is a look at um, one of the spreads that was inside that red book. So this was sort of our, um, our own version of an exhibition catalog within this collection of objects. And looking at this kind of, we wanted to do a more classical setting for the headline treatment. Here, this drawing on the left was created by Juman Malouf and she created por these quirky portraits of each curator that were really you know, beautiful and delicate, but also kind of strange in a way. And we really like the relationship of this typeface plant in to that, something that has, you know, is a beautifully drawn classical typeface, but also quite quirky in its own way. These are some images of the artworks as displayed inside the exhibition cases. That's also a part of the book. So the book has several sections within it. Um, one of which are the in series of interviews with the curators and there's reproductions of artworks within the cases and then also the larger checklist of all the objects within the exhibition. So again, you know, cataloging every aspect of the exhibition in a way, but in a really different manner from the preceding exhibition catalog that was already published for the Vienna exhibition. Here are a couple more of the items um, in more detail, a transcription of a conversation between the curators and Jason Schwartzman on the left. Um, this booklet on the right is an accordion booklet that um, documented the exhibition design of the exhibition as it was um, shown in Milan. And we created collaged um, imageries, uh, images of all the exhibition walls within the exhibition. And finally, this poster, which shows the, all of the objects from the exhibition arrayed on a single surface. It's hard to see at this scale. You might be able to see it a little bit on the, um, this is a detail of the image in the middle here, but each one was numbered and correlated to the checklist within the book. And again, what we're going for here is to kind of recreate that feeling of density and this kind of cabinet of wonder. I think it has, a really nice relationship again to that one of those original inspirations that we had is this illustration of this cabinet of curiosities that you see on the right this idea of objects sort of being everywhere. And then another detail of one of uh, the components within the package this archival box I had uh, several postcards photographing some of the objects that were included. 
And of course, the slides and the recipe also included within this box as well. Then these are some of the installation installation views of the exhibition. In this case, the exhibition actually had the uh, Italian title Il Sarcofago di Spitzmaus e Altri Tesori when it was um, restaged in Milan. This is a bread room that featured uh, miniatures. Another view, again, they had, they had created small uh, thematic groupings with these beautiful custom built jewel like cases covered in uh, colored felt. And in this case, I actually got to visit the exhibition, which is sometimes the rarity. You uh, end up designing a catalog without ever having seen the exhibition. And then you don't really have an idea of whether or not they sort of relate to each other or how they might relate to each other. I mean, in this case, I was able to visit the exhibition. And it was a really great feeling to know how well the, these two things kind of related to each other. This is a green grouping featuring a collection of bright green malachite objects. And then another portrait wall also covered in felt as well. And I'm just going to end with one of my favorite objects in the exhibition here. This is a beautiful miniature figurine, which was you know, in the red room displayed with his uh, seasonal shoe wear. I've shown you a range of rather expressive and complex designs in some ways, but all of them that boil down to really um, a, an aggregate of small decisions, framing and thoughtful placement of a few elements. And, and in the end, that's um, all that's really needed. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those examples. And it was such a nice um, ending to to end with your the project that you and your team had worked on. And I've seen that um, that book in person is it's the most gorgeous object. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a stunning thing. And what's, you know, but beyond just, you know, it being a stunning, beautiful object, what I love about it is that it really speaks to the spirit and, you know, quote, unquote, attitude of the of the the kind of curatorial in, intent and also the you know the spatial the um the the exhibition design and like the kind of materiality of the designs of course there are things that are inherent to a book and then things that are inherent to a spatial design but i just think it's so amazing to see how these things come together um and i think it's a really really good example nice example of everything you've talked about um you know in your in your um in your presentation today so thank you for that um, and, you know, I just want to preface, I, you know, I have some follow up questions, I, but I do want to preface it all by saying, you know, when we talk about the book, I want you guys, the students to, to, to be very open about what you, how you think about a book. Of course, you know, the traditional way of thinking about a book is a thing that is printed. It's a series of pages. It is bound on one side. Um, it's a physical volume. You can, you know, buy it, distribute it, etc. But I think, you know, especially in the age that we're living in, a book may not have a physical volume. It may only mm -hmm. exist as, you know, as digital data. Um, and especially in, in your case, for this graduating class, that's what it will be. It will be a, a, a digital thing. At the same time, I think whether it's digital or, or physical, we, we have to consider, you know, all the kind of same things. Like we have to think about um, you, sequence. We have to think about how you start something, how you finish something. What is the arc? Um, what is the tone? Like what are the choices? Um, and you ended with a really nice thought, which is ultimately it's just a series of making these small you know, choices, right? Small decisions, which in the end add up to something much, much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. So those, those facts don't change, whether it is a physically printed thing or it's just digitally shared. So I think, you know, you should think about the book, quote unquote, as something that is actually very open um, and broad. Um, and so even though the examples that Gian showed, what those are all physical books, and I think that's nice because there is this other element beyond you know, the thing that you put together on your desktops, there is the kind of production aspect of it, which really completes the loop, completes the process. Um, I think there are many lessons that you can learn from these examples in any case. Um, and so- I totally um, agree. 
Yeah, so I, this is slightly unrelated, but I thought it was interesting when I was looking at your bio um, and thinking about your experiences because you know you've worked as a as an in-house designer at Barney's New York. Um, you've also had an independent practice and um, you know working independently for various clients. Um, and now you work at a design agency, um, which is, you know, it's kind of a medium sized agency in New York and that does lots of different kinds of clients, but it's different kinds of, uh, you know, and different kinds of projects with different clients. Um, I was wondering what it was like to, for you to sort of adjust into those different roles, because in a way, I imagine if you're a, a, an in-house designer, you have to somewhat represent that brand or the kind of attitude of, of that, um, you know, that company. Um, and then as an independent practitioner, you're kind of representing yourself. So you're sort of in some ways control, in control of the clients that you take on, but also the tone with which the work is produced. At a design studio, maybe it's somewhere in between, but also you have to negotiate, you know, your own visual agenda with the interests of the client and what the studio mandates or is interested in at that moment. So how, how do you feel like your, your role or how your approach changes in these different scenarios? Yeah, um, it's interesting to think about. I think actually, like strangely enough, when I was working more independently and then when I made the transition to two by four, it wasn't as jarring or as different as you would think it might be. I think a lot of people think that like having your own practice is sort of like that's where you insert your own voice and then a studio setting is one in which you're you know, maybe your independent, your personal voice is suppressed in some ways, but I think actually may, perhaps why I landed there was the um, alignment in which like how I approach projects myself personally and the studio approaches them were really similar. So I guess to me, it's always been about that sort of process is what I attracted me to the studio and was sort of inherent in my own personal working process as a kind of, shall I say, like more of a kind of like sort of goal oriented conceptual approach to a project always at the sort of outset. But of course, working in house versus you know, working for a diverse set of clients, it is a really different exercise. I think it's, it is a much more kind of limited vocabulary that you know you have access to like oftentimes you are following brand guidelines or there's a certain typeface or a color palette perhaps that you're working within which again seems you know really limiting but I think there's always spaces in which you have to make a lot of decisions that you know even brand guidelines can't dictate and those are things in which you have to sort of bring your decision making um process and sensibility I think to to that so in, in those in those senses I think you know in the end sort of like what remains always is like your own approach to a project in a way is what remains so consistently throughout whatever the practice is like um it's just whether or not um how diverse your palette can be in terms of like, okay you, you can't have access to every typeface you want to do but um in terms of having a kind of way to navigate through design decisions I think in some ways like you, you kind of come back to this the same decision making skills or um processes that you have inherent to your own practice yeah and I think yeah maybe it's it's yeah the, maybe those things are not so different it's the difference is that you know design is always about constraints and whether those constraints are self self-imposed or those constraints are sort of in place you know in a sometimes in a document um because mm -hmm. you know there's a gu guideline or some kind of um sort of overarching mandate that's already there so i you know in any scenario though i you know i think it's actually um you never do a project that's like free of constraints and i think actually those, right. are, those are very helpful and i think sometimes it's what you know being a student um it's a little bit tricky sometimes because you you're responsible for all all of those as, uh, uh, aspects right like you have to be the author of the thing you have to be the designer you have to be the fabricator and you have to have you know your own editor your own curator um which is really fun it's amazing to have all of that control but it's also it can be quite daunting so what are your totally. um what's 
yeah, what's your advice on sort of self-imposed constraints for, for students when, they're, when they approach these, uh, these projects? I mean, for, for this project, this immediate thing, which is the graduation portfolio, but really in general. I think um, sort of going back to some like trying to define for yourself some of those qualities to begin with, like to me, again, like not thinking about everything at once and really kind of breaking it out in terms of like, okay, I'm just going to write down a list of qualities that I think are relevant to my work or to my process and start with that. And then kind of systematically moving through each decision. For me, it's always been really helpful. Sort of like if you stare at a, a white page or a blank document and you're like, okay, let's go about designing this thing, it become really daunting and I think with every design project, you're always, everyone's always refining their own methodology, of course, sort of like, how do you even um, begin to work? And I think for me, again, kind of thinking about what you're trying to achieve first before you even get into the design process, such a, a valuable practice for me. And it helped me sort of, again, you know, not having to be overwhelmed by, okay, I need to think about the language. I need to think about the design. What is the typeface? What are the margins? Everything, I think when you, when you approach it more incrementally, it becomes much more manageable. And it's like, okay, well, what am, what's the attitude or tonality I'm trying to achieve? Is something I think that is a really approachable question for anybody and something that you have like an immediate and visceral response to. So just starting with something like that, I think is um, kind of nice and, and takes out the kind of uh, difficulty of approaching like the project at every possible angle all at once. Yeah, I think that's actually a really, um, that's good advice. And actually it sort of answers another question I had, which was like, where do you start? And I think different designers, have different starting points. I remember um, totally. Irma Bohm, who's, you know, obviously a kind of, um, you know, one of the most important book designers of our generation, you know, of, 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 of in the world. Um, and she's made <laughs> so, so many amazing books, um, mm -hmm. you know, in her career and still continues to. And, you know, when you go to her, her studio, famously, she has a bookshelf that's just filled with white dummies, right? So it's just right. it's like no content, it's just white dummies. And dummies, for those of you that don't know what that means, are just these kind of blank, book forms so they're kind of like models in a way but there's nothing there's no um, content or any printing it's just white paper whatever paper you want to use for a particular book you get use that paper you use those materials and binding methods and you make the thing so her process it seems is like she needs to feel it like she needs feel it, right? a physical mm -hmm. thing and hold it and understand how heavy it is and you know how the stiff the pages are like that's her starting point you know i think it's that's actually quite unique i don't think everybody does it that yeah. way but i but it is a really interesting uh, revealing thing because it it shows what what kind of designer she is right um mm -hmm. but i think your your um uh introduction at the beginning of the lecture about like it's you know and you just reiterated it think about the qualities like what is the personality of this thing if this book was a person if your portfolio was a person like what kind of person is it um and you know i think the mac groaning uh, uh illustration was a like, really really funny one you know like the jock or like the stoner um, of course <laughs> Hopefully your portfolio isn't the stoner, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to leave the stoner portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's actually a really interesting way, and it's very approachable way, as you said, to think about something that could feel quite daunting and quite you know monumental um, before you begin. So just to think about like what kind of friend is it, what kind of book is it? I think that's actually a very very helpful way to way to sort of you know start that process. Um, there was a very specific. Uh, question in the chat actually which was oh yeah what are, yeah what what are your thoughts <laughs> on <laughs> what are your thoughts on justified uh, text <laughs> versus not just yeah. unjustified text I mean I totally don't think it's taboo whatsoever um I don't know you, yeah I mean, you've shown I, it I think, you used it yeah I've I've used it I use it actively use it um it requires some like massaging in terms of like typesetting and things like that to make it look good, but totally not taboo at all. Mm. And um, yeah, I would say like, don't feel, yeah. Don't yeah, feel like I, you cannot. <laughs> I mean, in a way, like, what, you are, what is taboo? Exactly, right? It's like, yeah. there is, like there is nothing's no taboo anymore. 
exactly there's, there's no such thing as taboo i mean there yeah. are things that i tell students that are taboo but then i also say but you can totally break these rules like right. you're not allowed to do this yeah, but you can like, totally break them yeah you know? i was like not um, having a grid maybe that's taboo but <laughs> <laughs> and I, but i think having some rules at the beginning is just those rules are just there to help you they're not Definitely. there to restrict you per se they're here to help there to help you and i think you know the the question of um justifying not justifying you know that's actually an interesting question especially in the in the context of um architecture school because that's a little bit of a trope in the uh, like field of architecture is to just justify everything because mm. I think I think students or even arch practicing architects, feel, you know, they're, they're attracted by justify type because it makes rectangles. It looks <laughs> like it looks clean. Every, it fills the box, right? right? Um, right. As you said, while it's filling the box, it's actually doing some other things within the box, and it takes it actually takes massaging. It actually takes in some ways much more work to to refine that. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's just an example of when you do something you have to adjust another thing you can't just flip on the switch for one thing and expect it to all like fall into place or work right. especially with typography it's just it's always this kind of refined kind of pulling of different levers and adjusting things um, mm -hmm. and that can you know that can get quite tedious as you know yeah it can be tricky just because uh, images are often themselves boxes and say you know you have a limited field a page that you're working on and then again like you don't want to have a proliferation of boxes that are creating um start becoming shapes weirdly on the page like you want to have a sense of white space and that's helpful um but again like i oh now i see something about hyphenation <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting like, wow, really people are really getting teeth. into granular i was like <laughs> is everyone typesetting their um, portfolios already um again like i I don't think there's anything taboo about hyphenations and if anything actually well especially with maybe justified text like some hyphenations sometimes necessary just create like to balance white space and things like that um yeah i wouldn't i would say that taboo was i mean i i in a way i think it, you know even though these are very micro questions i, I think it's encouraging that you students are thinking about it because i think what's i think what you want to avoid is not having thought about these decisions Right? right like doing something just by default because that you were just used to doing it like not thinking about hyphenation and just having it on by default because that's how InDesign does it you know relying mm -hmm. on just the default of the system or the, of the software just be, you know using the default typeface that's in you know adobe programs just because you didn't make a choice so i think those are the things that you want to avoid right if there's a taboo i think that's the taboo is like not thinking but you know as right. long as you're thinking about these things and making active choices i think that's i think i think that's great another question here is do you have a process of selecting graphic references before designing a book or a catalog a process of choosing design references to include within the publication or? i wonder if this means a little bit more like kind of a mood board or like a reference board or something like this i think I mean, for me, I do often like, uh, I would say, like one of the first things, you know, we do even within the studio is again, defining those qualities, whether it's a publication project or it's a branding project, we definitely go through that exercise of defining the qualities first. And then sort of once you have a clear notion of what those qualities are, I do immediately like have you know, things like it's like it's bold and exuberant. Like you're like, okay, I'm gonna let me look at that big monograph. I know that like has that tonality, or like let me pull this book. So I do kind of go to references just to it's almost like a visual reminder of like what are the visual moves that they've done that made it feel that way. Like you know, mm -hmm. you know the general tonality. You don't remember all the design decisions that are embedded in those things. So it's, sometimes it's useful. It's like oh, they did. You know black and white they overprinted this color and that made it feel really exuberant or something and so maybe that's you know a technique that i want to borrow or some kind of gesture again like it, it the image was cropped off the right up hand of the page and that makes it feel really like expansive and it's like bleeding off the page that's a something that feels really bold and immersive um again i think it's just useful to kind of do that exercise for yourself always almost to it's about almost training your brain to read what visual moves are. I mean, for me, even 
putting this presentation together and having to really kind of deconstruct and analyze what the design moves are. There were things that, there were lots of things I've never thought about. Like, oh, there's that page number on the cover or, you know, everything really is flat. Like you don't really you just, you know, experience the book really visually um, and you don't really um, analyze usually what those design decisions are sort of until you're forced to or you kind of train yourself to do that a little bit more. So I think it's always really good to do in general. Yeah, I agree. I think they're really helpful. And, you know, you want, and it's also, you can use the same kind of reference images, but it's also about interpretation, right? So it's, it's always a starting point. I love actually seeing that really sure. extreme or almost kind of maniacal collage of uh, images that you show as part of the book, you know, the fold out thing with the mm -hmm. 500 um, objects. I oh, mean, right. it's a crazy thing, but it's so amazing to see. But then that next to the reference image that the kind of black and white etching, that was like the kind of reference image. I mean, you know, visually they're totally different um, in terms of mm -hmm. like media, they're totally different, but there's an essence there that is communicated by that reference image. Right. I think is actually super useful before you go on to make the thing. Right. Um, I think what's really funny is that sometimes you make the thing and you don't really realize, like to me, I didn't even think of that black and white etching like explicitly, but then when I was putting this presentation together, it's like, oh, there is there is a formal relationship here. And like, that's probably why we moved in that direction to kind of put everything silhouetted and really dense is because we're trying to create that density. And like, where did that visual idea of density come from? I think yeah. it came from the original, you know, um, cabinet of curiosities and how they were always displayed. But you don't really think about it sometimes. Uh, consciously it's almost like right. you have a visual uh, kind of intuition about it or response to it totally um there's some more questions uh talk <laughs> a bit about uh your preference of binding options and generally how books are held together <laughs> <laughs> i mean it could be a whole class of binding yeah. but do you, have, do you have any preferences maybe actually to narrow this question down do you have any um uh, sort of tips on like accessible sort of easy types of binding that could be you know available to us um i mean i think it's i actually had like a one slide that was just about different kind of typologies of media formats like in printed matter so things like magazine or a reference book or soft cover book i think you know even really simple things like coil binding or perfect binding there's specific tonalities to common media types, right? Like a magazine that's all glossy and it's perfect bound and um, it's very floppy. I think those are, to me, like there's always something really interesting and fun to play with. Like, again, it's almost, it, it's like media types have like personalities almost. And those are things you can kind of leverage. You know, it's like, oh, a, a magazine's kind of cheap and glossy and I, I, you know, want my project to feel kind of like trashy and fun or something, say, and you can um, kind of deploy that like, you know, tabloid language or something to kind of really um, hone in on that. So I don't know if I really answered the question, but no, I, I think, think really common, common forms are, and really owning them or like really kind of delving into them. It's always like something that I really enjoy. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I was actually yeah. going to mention this, but Lila did, uh, went ahead and did it, which is there is a there is a resources um, page on the graphics project um, page of, of the GSAP site. And there's a whole thing on binding uh, with diagrams. So you guys should definitely check it out. And, um, you know, as I said earlier on, you know, you guys are thinking about the students are thinking about um, the digital form of the book. But as I've said before, you know, we will come out of this era and we will hold books again and we will print things again. <laughs> so I think it's actually generally um, really helpful to, to you know, know about these methods. And also next time you investigate your own library, your own bookshelf, now you'll start to look at things a little bit differently, right? Um, not only just mm -hmm. the graphic design and the typography and the grid, but also the way that something is put together, the physical aspects of it. So I think it's actually sort of nice to, you know, think about books from, uh, from all these different perspectives. One last question, which I think is actually a really good one and very relevant to us now is that mm -hmm. um, with digital format portfolios, what are some aspects we can leverage to our advantage that a printed version cannot achieve? 
Mm. So you, I mean, you're also communicating with clients on the other side of the world right now. Even in New York, you're not meet, doing face to face at the moment, so you're trans transmitting everything digitally. So you know you've probably thought about this a lot. Like, what are the advantages um, of of communicating this way? Yeah, I mean, just the ability to share something like a digital document is something that I think is really valuable. You know, like a book, of course, it's mass produced as well, but its audience is much more limited. The fact that you could essentially, you know, share your publication, your I'm using publication here, like the digital publication online in any format, it's super accessible. You know, really anyone with the screen can look at it, I think is a really powerful thing. Of course, there's also things like animation and things like that that come into like the digital language that I think a presentation, even if it's in static form, like slide by slide, it's you can think of it as a slow moving animation, really. Um, I mean, books are so related to animation as well, in a way, there's like an, a you know progression from front to back, and it's all about sequence as well. So they're both related to that in a way, but I think obviously, you know, the digital form sort of goes, moves more in the direction of something that's in motion and just kind of playing off on those things. Like when you click on from slide to slide, it becomes something, just another thing to consider, like something can literally animate, some things are aligned, you can build, like there can be a progression or an animation that builds through time in a progression of slides, for example, there's some things like scale as well that I think um, work really well in a digital format that, um, you know, perhaps like print wouldn't be able to um, do as well. Yeah. I think there's I, just, you know, if you, you know, I have a pretty large desktop computer and you think about the kind of immersive quality of like the whole screen when you're like uh, presenting something and you are viewing it in that form, there's something really powerful about the sheer kind of image quality also that it brings, you know, you can yeah. have a really powerful single image and it means something I think really different than if you had a printed form and it's quite small, you have a full bleed image and you always are dealing with that gutter. So you are never gonna have this clean moment. If you have like a large powerful image on a screen, it's just has this kind of iconic or you know monumental quality that really a printed thing maybe can't have as much just because of that the divide between the pages. Yeah, I mean, I think these are all actually really good points. Um, I think it's easy to feel limited because of you know what we're going through right now, but actually to think to actually sort of turn it upside down and think about the advantages of the of the. Um, the screen medium is actually really important and actually I think a very good learning experience. I think all of the things you've said and also I would add to that another advantage is that you can't really control how somebody looks at your book. They might actually start from the last page. I often do that when I go, go to a bookstore and pick up a book, you know, right. I kind of go like who backwards. designed this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it's any good, I want to look yeah. at who designed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like look at the binding, these sorts of things. I mean, yeah. I don't I don't necessarily interact with it in the classical traditional sense. I might right. you know do, sure, do something that's not in, wasn't intended by the designer yeah. but with a with a slide presentation or with something that's on screen you of course you can skip around but in a way you kind of have to go in sequence it's true. I think that could be a little bit of a of a strength and you know I think it relates very much to what you said about like going from page one two three four it could actually be this kind of almost like an animation because it's a fixed sequence um how it takes changes from page to page becomes very, very explicit in a way that's maybe a little bit not as explicit in a, a physical book. Um, I think mm -hmm. that could be something that you could use to your advantage. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Jian. That was great. Um, yeah, I love looking so at the examples and also ending with your amazing um, book that you made for from that too. When, when was that book produced? Um, I think it was just last, no. 2019 now I was like wait we're 2021 now so yeah, <laughs> yeah 2019 no. now yeah okay. yeah um sorry I, I think I think it, it the, the lecture was really uh, informative for for all of us I'm sure the students really appreciated it and um I can't wait to talk to, to talk to them more about it thank you so much thank for coming so much thank you thanks guys <laughs>